in the greasy or burnt pans. They do the washing up in Satoyama villages. This traditional arrangement is called the riverside method. It's used all over Japan. Cleaned up by the kangup, the tank water eventually rejoins the channel. For some wildlife, the man-made creek provides an ideal place to raise young. Like this variety of freshwater goby, a small fish about as long as a little finger. The villagers call it the tiny mud crawler. A male is busy excavating a breeding site. The even bottom supplies a perfect hidey hole. As always, the best locations are highly sought after. Here comes another male. He'd like to move in. And he's prepared to fight for it. do all they can to look threatening. Opening their mouths and erecting their dorsal fins to look bigger. It's a victory for the sitting tenant. another goby behind him. She's hanging upside down and she's laying eggs. The victory over the den gave her a place to spawn in safety. simple life of Satoyama communities is attracting some young Japanese back from the cities. It's June, four months after the hungry flames licked the air. Reeds that rose from the ashes now reach overhead. The marshy landscape takes on its summer look. The dense growth is almost like a jungle. A world filled with tiny lives. Each single reed stem is a microcosm. Tiny organisms called pseudoplankton live on their surface. Forests of tentacles reach out to seize organic material. spring, young carp hatched in the flooded fields. They stay there for about three months. The reed beds are their nurseries, where they have plenty to eat and are concealed from predatory birds. An infant fish meets a sudden end. It's been grabbed.
The attacker is the larva of Japan's largest dragonfly. This aggressive ambusher hides in sand or gravel. Only its head protrudes as it lies in wait for its prey. Its correct name is the golden-ringed dragonfly. But to the Japanese and to Sangoro, in its adult form, it's the king of dragonflies. Chicks accompany a parent coot. Now is the best time to find food. An adult calls in warning. The cause? The coot's number one enemy, a weasel, egg thief and baby coot snatcher. A narrow escape. Waterfowl have to guard against foxes and snakes too. For safety, grebes make floating fortresses anchored to firmly rooted plants. An adult bird is particularly alert when the eggs are hatching. Each grebe has its own territory, and each nests at the same place every year. Here comes Sangoro. The birds know him already. This is his regular route. He spends two hours checking all the traps he set yesterday. His work done, Sangoro returns to the landing stage. You should see the ones that got away. Turning muddy banks into reed beds has paid dividends. He has nearly 50 fish in all of eight different types. <laughs> Sangoro won't eat the smallest fish. He puts them aside. He will share his good fortune. This grey heron knows what will happen next. Sangoro finishes cleaning out his boat, and another pair of eyes watches his every move. Each fishing season, this kite pays Sangoro a visit. When Sangoro leaves, the grey heron doesn't wait any longer. It's happy to clear up. Sangoro left the tiddlers for the birds. It's his way of sharing nature's riches with those around him. And they are only too pleased to take part. The kite 
will take the fish back to hungry chicks. Where the village houses crowd most closely together, above a garden, a lone pine towers. On a branch is a large nest. steadily under the watchful eyes of the villagers. Sangoro's gift is a token of the village's close ties with wildlife. For Sangoro, fishing is not just a job. 